I'm going to ask that we bow our heads in prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. In a great audience like this, there are hundreds of people with problems and burdens and difficulties. Some of you on the verge of almost giving up. The pressures are too great. There seems to be no way out of your problems and your dilemmas. Tonight there's an answer. Some of you are running from God tonight. Oh, you go to church. You may be a good church member. But deep in your heart, you know that you're running from God. You're away from him and you need to come back to him in a recommitment of your life to Jesus Christ. There are others of you that have professed Christ, but you've really never known him as your own Lord and Savior. Tonight you can find him. You that are loaded down with guilt, as so many Americans are now, he can take all that guilt away because the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth from all sin. And I want you to listen quietly and reverently tonight to the message that God has laid upon my heart to give to you. Our Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. And may many come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior this night. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 34. Beginning at verse 34, I want to speak on the subject tonight of Jaws. And I'll tell you why I call it Jaws in just a moment. And before I forget it, I would also like to say that I have written a book entitled Angels, God's Secret Agents. You can buy it at any bookstore in the United States right now. And this would be also a good book to give away at Christmas time. There are hardly any books written on angels ever, and I don't understand it. Hundreds and thousands of books on the devil and demons and the occult, but very few on angels. So I decided to write what the scripture teaches about angels, and there's more to say about it than I ever dreamed that can comfort your life and change your life and reassure you. Did you know that there's an angel that comes when you die as a Christian and brings you into the very presence of God? You can get it at any bookstore right now. Here's the words of Jesus, Matthew 12. Old generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof at the judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign. Show us a sign so that we can believe in you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're only going to get one sign from me. And that's the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. During the past few months, we've been listening and hearing and reading all about the Hollywood's blockbuster of the year. It's already been viewed by one out of every four Americans. And I, I had never heard of this book until my son came home from school and he had a copy of it and he said, Dad, I think you ought to read it. 
and I started reading little bits here and there. I didn't like some of the language in it, but it was a fascinating book. And it's the account of a killer shark in the waters around Martha's Vineyard in New England who swallows victims and delimbs a lot of victims. And they made a motion picture out of it that's shown all over the world. And Time magazine made a cover story of it. And they could only liken it to Jonah and the whale. They could only find that one literary reference in literature of Jonah and the whale. And so the front pages of our newspapers have carried story after story about how people are afraid to go swimming on the beaches in California and Oregon and Washington and up and down the East Coast this past year or this past summer. And then I read the other day about a man in Australia that lassoed a two-ton shark in Australian waters. Well, I can understand that because I've seen a many a shark in Australia. Cliff Barris and I were out swimming one day in the surf, and there came running up to us some men, and they said, watch out, the sharks are on the way. There was a shark alert up, and we were out swimming right where the sharks were supposed to be. And we had a girl in Australia that played in one of our motion pictures, The Shadow of the Boomerang. She played the part of a nurse, and she was a very wonderful girl. And she went out with her fiancé, and the boat got stuck in the water or in the sand. And she got out to help lift the boat off the sand, and she wasn't in water more than waist deep. And a shark came along and took off her leg. And she died before they could get any medical attention to her. And down in Daytona Beach, Florida, they said they had five shark attacks on humans this past year. But this is the year of the big fish stories, both factual and fictional. And it's interesting to me that at the same time this picture has come out frightening people, we have another picture called the Towering Inferno and another one called Earthquake. Besides all the B pictures with all their horror, and monster pictures that are coming out to frighten people. No wonder people are biting their fingernails off and taking tranquilizers and afraid to move in their sleep at night. There's never been such an avalanche of horror and fright, and some of it very sophisticated, to descend upon the human race. And in addition to that, we have to think about the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb and all the other things that they're thinking about. And I heard a man on television last night talking about the possibility of a climate war, that we can so control the climate of the world that the next war may be fought and won by the nation that can control the climates of the world, that they can cause gigantic glaciers to come over parts of the world, or they can cause great tidal waves to sweep over parts of the world. And so we're living at a time when people, Jesus said their hearts would fail them for fear. And today, if ever there was a frightened generation from almost every angle, it is today. But that's not what I want to talk about. I like Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the big fish, better than I do Jaws because Jonah was saved, not destroyed by a big fish. You say, Billy, do you really believe that this fish swallowed Jonah? Notice I'm calling it a fish because the Bible says a big fish was prepared by the Lord. It doesn't call it a whale. It does in this passage in the New Testament, but in the book of Jonah, it says a big fish. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a big shark for all I know. Do you say, do you believe that actually happened? Yes, I believe it. Why? because Jesus said it did. And that's all the proof I need. If Jesus believed it, then I believe it. But I believe that it took an even bigger miracle for this particular fish to be on the very spot where Jonah was thrown overboard and then by some mysterious programming of an internal computer to deposit Jonah precisely on the spot where God wanted him to be. And with all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting this story than they did 50 years ago. 
50 years ago, they'd laugh at Jonah and the big fish, but not today, after we've seen Jaws and some of these other things. And after all the scientific and technological achievements, and every once in a while you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll find that a man or a crocodile or an alligator or something has been swallowed by a big fish and they found him inside the fish, having never been digested, whatever. Now the story of Jonah is one of the most thrilling stories in all the Bible. It's only four little chapters. In fact, you could read it in about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. And the scripture says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go and preach judgment to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh had 600,000 population. And Nineveh was a city that was very wicked and very godless and very materialistic. It was a permissive society. Sexual immorality was rampant throughout Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to warn them that they are going to be judged in 40 days unless they repent. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. People ask me why I preach the gospel. I'm going to tell you why I preach the gospel. I'm 56 years of age, almost 57. I've been preaching now over 30 years. I'm going to continue to preach as long as the Lord gives me breath and gives me strength. Why? Because the word of the Lord came unto me and said, Billy, go and preach. Preach to the nations of the world. Warn them of judgment. Tell them of God's love. Tell them of God's grace. Tell them that God can forgive and that God can change their lives. That's why I go. I don't go because I love to travel anymore. I've seen almost all the world. I don't particularly like to get on planes and go all over the world traveling. Different kinds of water, different kinds of climate, the jet lag that bothers me more and more the older I get. I don't particularly enjoy any of that. I don't enjoy leaving my wife and my family as much as I do, and I'm sure Cliff Barris and Bev Shea and the others would say the same thing. We do it because the word of the Lord came unto us and told us as a team to go out. And God has kept us together as a team all these years, preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, and we have determined that we're going to continue it as long as God gives the strength. And as long as you will keep praying and supporting, we will continue proclaiming the gospel in these great crusades throughout the world. God called Jonah and said, go preach at Nineveh. Every Christian that is here tonight is called to ministry. Yes, you are called. I didn't say you were called to the ministry. I said you were called to ministry. Do you know what the word ministry means? The word ministry means service. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve. And every Christian is called to be a servant, to serve, to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve his fellow man. You know, many young people that are here tonight, I'm sure, are saying, I wonder what my vocation ought to be. What is God's will for my life? I have young people all the time coming to me saying, Mr. Graham, will you tell me how I can know the will of God for my life? Well, I have two or three little suggestions. First, study the Bible. God never leads you contrary to the Bible. Now, the Bible may not give you detailed guidance for this modern generation, but it gives you principles to go by. The second thing is to pray. You have not because you ask not. I have a friend here tonight who's a clergyman. He wasn't sure about God's will for his life. And he went to a fellow clergyman and he asked, I wasn't a fellow clergyman, he was, this young man was a student then. He went to a clergyman and he said, what shall I do? And the clergyman very wisely said, young man, if I were you, I would go out in the woods and I'd get on my knees and I would ask God 
what I was to do with my life, and I would stay on my knees until I knew. That's good advice. The third thing I would say to you young people is, ask advice. In the multitude of counselors, there's wisdom and safety, the Bible says. God has given you pastors and teachers and friends and parents. Yes, parents. To guide you. To advise you. But in the end, you will have to make up your own mind. You'll use the mind that God has given you. And you will evaluate the gifts that you have. Now, you have gifts, you have talents, and you can take them and bury them and never use them, and you'll be judged at the judgment seat of Christ someday. But when you are deciding to make your life's work, there are two things always remember. The wor first, the world and its need. This is a sick world. It's a broken world. And the world's need is Jesus Christ. Our problems are not going to be solved by political manipulation alone. Our problems are not economic alone. Our problems are not the energy crisis alone. We have a spiritual problem, the problem of sin, the problem of the human heart, the problem that man needs to be changed from the inside out. Evaluate the world's needs and evaluate its social needs as well. The hungry in Africa, the hungry in Bangladesh, the social injustices of the world. Think about all that when you decide what you're going to do with your life. Then the second thing, evaluate your own self and evaluate your own gifts. What is your gift? What is your talent? You say, but I don't have a gift. Every single Christian has been given a gift by the Holy Spirit. And you may not be using that gift. And you're sinning against God if you're not using that gift. Then after you have done these two things, evaluate the world and its need, evaluate yourself and your own gifts, then try to fit the two things together. I heard about an American missionary out in Indonesia some years ago. He had an expert knowledge on the country's oil deposits. And an American oil company sent him a cable and said, we will give you $20,000 a year if you will work for us. He wired back, no. They sent a cable, said, we'll give you 30000 He said, no. They said, we'll give you 50000 He said, no. And to a missionary who was getting $100 a month, $50,000 sounded like a lot of money. They said, we'll give you 100000 You name the price. We need your services at any cost. He said, you don't understand me. He said, the money is fine, but the job's not big enough. You see, he had a job as a missionary of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that was the biggest job in all the world. When the president of the United States offered John Mott the ambassadorship to Japan, John Mott pulled himself up to his full height and he said, Mr. President, I am honored, but I have a higher calling. I'm an ambassador of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and I will not stoop to be an ambassador of the United States. Jonah was called of God to go and proclaim the message that God had given him. But secondly, Jonah refused. You know, it's tough to do the will of God. You, you say to God tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'll do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go and be what you want me to be, and you're going to find tough going. Because, you see, to do what God wanted him to do, it was several journeys away over mountains and forests and burning deserts. And Nineveh was the wickedest city in the world, a city of 600,000 people. He would face disease and wild beasts and highway robbers, and then when he got there, the people may stone him to death. And Jonah began to run from God. Jonah couldn't take it. So he decided to flee from the presence of God, 
and he went down to Joppa and he got on a boat going to Tarshish and the scripture says he paid the fare thereof. And I want to tell you something. If you start running from the Lord, the devil will always have a boat there for you. And you'll always have the money to pay the way. And at first it'll be smooth going. You'll say, boy, I've made the right choice. I know I'm not doing God's will, but I'm doing what I want to do. And I know that I have made the right choice. But after a while, you're going to start running into some rough seas. Then the storms and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the rocks and the reefs are going to come. No man ever turned away from God and found happiness and peace and joy that was permanent and lasting. The psalmist asked, Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? And you know, Jonah thought he had paid the fare. And the captain thought so too. But then the storm came up. And the sailors were frightened. Jonah was asleep. And they said, what's wrong with our ship? Somebody on the ship must have displeased their God. And they began to pray to their gods. Isn't it strange how people began to pray when they're in trouble and maybe they haven't prayed in all their lives? They began to pray. And finally Jonah told them that he was the one after they'd cast lots and the lot came to Jonah. He confessed that he was running from God and they said, what will we do with you, Jonah? He said, throw me overboard. They said, no, we'll try something else first. And they began to row and row and row and they threw everything else over. But the storm got worse and worse and it looked like the ship was going to be wrecked. So finally in desperation, they threw Jonah over and immediately the sea calmed down. And the Bible says that Jonah was caught by a big fish. Now you think of the jaws that fish had. How wide his mouth must have been. But see, that was a specially prepared fish by God to be there at that precise moment. And let me tell you, when you run from God, you're going to be under God's judgment. And Jonah had three days and three nights in the belly of that fish to think. And brother, let me tell you, he was doing some thinking. And he was doing some praying. He was saying, Lord, save me, help me. I don't know where I am. What's happened? And God said, Jonah, I called you into my service and told you what to do, and you've refused me. Now, Jonah, if you're willing to repent of your sin... I'll give you another chance. And Jonah said, Yes, Lord, I repent. I'll keep my vow. And the Bible says on the third day, the fish vomited up Jonah. And Jonah found himself on dry land. And the scripture says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, God doesn't give many of us a second chance like that. But he gave Jonah a second chance. And Jonah ran as fast as he could in every way he could straight to Nineveh. And he went up and down the streets of Nineveh crying out, Repent! Turn to God! Judgment's coming in 40 days! Repent! 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 Of course, he didn't expect anybody to repent. But do you know what happened? That was the greatest and most successful evangelistic campaign in the history of the world. There's never been anything recorded in history like it. The king, the people, 600,000 of them repented and turned to God and God spared Nineveh. Suppose everybody in Washington suddenly repented and turned to God. And the people of America turned to God as we approach this bicentennial year. 
What a glorious and thrilling thing it would be. And I want to tell you this, if we did it, God would spare us. But if we don't, this country is in for judgment. Tonight, you as an individual can resist God's call to you and go deeper and deeper in sin. Or you can turn back to God and obey God and do God's will. Which is it going to be? There are many of you young people that have come to Texas Tech University. And you have gotten away from God. You need to come back to him tonight. And God will forgive the past. And give you another chance and another moment. To serve and follow him. And I'm going to ask you to do that in just a few minutes. Jonah preached the gospel of judgment. But you know there was an interesting thing about the message that he preached. There was no mercy in it. He didn't offer the people mercy. He didn't tell them that God loved them. But tonight, I have an opportunity to say to you much more than Jonah said to the people of Nineveh. I can say to you tonight that God loves you, and God is a merciful God, and God will forgive you. But Jonah didn't say that. He just said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, repent, repent. And the people repented. And that's why Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up at the judgment and testify against you. You see, they repented. Never hearing the gospel of mercy and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But you've heard the gospel of grace in Christ. And you have refused to repent. They had never heard that Jesus Christ was to die on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that God loved them so much that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. But in spite of that, they repented. And Jesus said, they are going to be your accusers on the day of judgment. They will testify against you. But then something very interesting happened. Jonah was upset. He didn't want Nineveh to repent. You see, he was obeying God's call to go and proclaim the message, but his heart still wasn't quite right with God because he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to attack his own country, Israel. And he had prophesied that judgment was coming and he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he wanted to see judgment come. He wanted to be able to say, I told you so. But he didn't know the mercy and the grace and the love of God that would take these wicked, godless Ninevites and forgive them and change them and transform them if they would only turn to him. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is willing to forgive anybody, even you, whatever your sins are, however bad you've been. God says, I love you. I gave my son for you. I forgive you. But Jonah didn't like that, so he went outside the city and got up on top of a hill and looked down over the city, and he had a, a hard, mean scowl on his face as he looked down on the city, waiting for God to burn it up. And the hot wind and the sun came, and he was tired and he was angry. And the Bible says that God allowed during the night a gourd to grow up by a miracle and covered Jonah and the next morning a worm came and cut it off and it fell and Jonah sat there in the sun and the hot wind blowing on him and God said Jonah you're worried about that gourd and you love that gourd more than you do those 600,000 people of Nineveh and that's how the book of Jonah ends And tonight, many of you are more interested in materialism, your own personal safety. You're interested more in the things that money can buy 
and the comforts of life and the affluency that we've developed in the United States. You are more interested in that than you are doing the will of God and sharing in the mercy and the grace of God. And let me tell you, you're going to have to make a choice. Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road and the narrow road. There are two destinies, heaven and hell. There are two ways to live, two masters, materialism and God. Which is your master? Which road are you on? And God has put a little computer down inside of you. You've got a computer system down there. It's your will. And you have the ability to choose whether you're going to serve Christ and whether you're going to serve God and his kingdom and put yourself in the will of God and say, Oh, Lord, I'll march in your army. I'll march under your flag. I'll go out with love in my hearts to try to help change the world. I'll go out and do your will no matter what it costs, whether it's a burning desert or a steaming jungle. I'll go out even if it means I have to break up with my boyfriend who doesn't live for God. I will go out, O oh Lord, and serve you no matter what the cost. And Jesus said, count the cost. If you're not willing to pay the price, then quit it. Don't even fool with it. It's costly to follow Christ. But I want to tell you the rewards are absolutely unbelievable. The reward of joy and peace and security, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you're going to heaven, knowing that you're in the will of God, whatever comes and whatever goes.